You're listening to Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ and Randy. India's money madness, Zcash malware mining on mobile phones, IMF scandals with no real consequences, and Chris Pacia from Open Bazaar joins us in studio. All this and more on episode 187 here on Wednesday, December 21st, 2016. Randy? In the traditional markets, we've got gold down again to uh, $1,132. $1, Silver is down to $15.93. Oil is up again to $52.60 a barrel. The Dow Jones rises to a new record high again this a- week to again, 19. Times four. <laughs> yeah, to 19,941. <laughs> Points. Uh, the 30 year U.S. Treasury yield drops to 3.112%. Which is noteworthy because this is the first time that that yield has dropped instead of increased per, per our show in, I believe, a month. Yeah. So that is since, since the election results, actually. Uh, the euro is down slightly to 104. The Chinese yuan is uh, still holding around 14 cents, and the British pound is down to $1.24. In crypto markets, Bitcoin is up at $825. Litecoin down just slightly to $3.57. Zcash is down to $36.16. Dash is up to $9.80. Ethereum down to $7.89. Monero is up to $8.41. And Augur Rep tokens are down to $2.81. And finally, of course, Doge is in parity with Doge. One Doge equals one Doge. And just a reminder, you can tune into Neocache Radio every Wednesday night. If you don't want to miss a single moment of awesome Neocache content, including special episodes and bonus interviews, you can subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, Library, and more. Excellent. All the places. Well, thank you so much, Randy. And thank you, Chris Pacey, for joining us here in studio on a new cash radio thanks for having me again and so chris you you are currently working with open bazaar in the the lead back-end developer is that correct correct and you th- there's so much news we mentioned a few things i believe in the few episodes ago that uh you had recently gotten more funding um at the, the it's still running right <laughs> it hasn't, yeah. hasn't hasn't crashed hasn't fallen apart and the government hasn't come seized all your stuff <laughs> yeah yeah and it's it's it'll hopefully be getting better too you know we have more more funding more developers more support and uh i'm i'm looking forward to seeing it be taken up to the next level well next. for people who don't know uh, open bazaar is a peer-to-peer marketplace and uh, Yep, yep. Uh, e-commerce marketplace. It's it's designed, to, like you said, it's peer to peer. The purpose is to be kind of uh, censorship resistant to some extent to allow people to sell whatever they want on there, and um, uh, you know, with no intermediaries to tell them how or what they can sell or for how much or take any cut or anything like that. Excellent. Well, it's uh, it's wonderful to have you on the show again. And now you've been on the show once before, at least, and this is the first time here in our new studio. And as always, you're welcome to join in and talk about what we are talking about. But we have some big news stories we want to get to first before we talk to Chris more about Open Bazaar. And starting right off the top, we've got India is once again the big story. The uh, India's prime minister. So we're going to back up and we're going to cover this a little bit more, uh, I guess, from the beginning. Uh, sort of. Anyway, India's prime minister had a secret plan to secure a payday for the central bank. So it turns out even in his home, he was... He was meeting with people and enacting this plan to demonetize or to replace two of the notes in India's currency portfolio. Right. Yeah. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. That's right. 182, I think. Yeah. So uh, the five, 501,000. So the newest things was, that I found out was that, that he was so secret about it that they were doing the meetings in his own home and, and not even in a, a government office or so to speak. Um, but anyway... So this happened on November 8th. Note holders had until December 30th to exchange old notes for the newly printed ones. And the new ones were a 500 and a 2,000 rupee note. And the, the, the issue with the 2,000 rupee note and even the 5,000 is that a lot of the store people don't want to accept those notes because it clears them out of all the small rupee bills they have. And, and that causes a problem. Because yes, I saw that. You can't buy anything with them even if you have it yeah. because they, they can't make change. So the whole, those whole, uh, this whole plan was projected to profit the central bank of roughly $45 billion. Now, now, how so? Well, some ignorant bureaucrats estimated that 20, 21% of the currency would not be exchanged, thus creating a profit for the balance sheet of the bank, right? Hmm. But after st- the studies had, had already been given to these people, and, and in years before, studies had, had concluded that only 6% of India's black market wealth is held in cash. The rest of it is in gold and property and capital assets. 
So and even in, in 2012, India's Central Board of Direct Cat Taxes advised against this demonetization scheme as well. But they went ahead with it anyway. And billions of India's, have, India's people have suffered because of it. The economy has slumped now as consumers are struggling to get a hold of enough of the newly no- printed notes. And then, as we just talked about, they can't even spend certain ones. As expected, the plan was poorly executed and there are not enough notes printed to meet initial demands. Now, Bitcoin has seen a dramatic rise in adoption in India as individuals look to other methods to ease this currency crunch. And uh, many Bitcoin startups have seen a boost, both in interest and users. The short-term ramifications are not all that dazzling, to be honest. The, uh, the long-term ramifications, though, are really good because more and more people in India are getting their eyes and ears on, on Bitcoin. And in fact, it's being printed in newspapers and, and big stories. Now, India has been no stranger to Bitcoin, but the fact that it's happening now when they're looking desperately for alternatives might lead more people to find Bitcoin. Certainly. So, now, there, were, there are rumors right now going around that uh, India may be banning gold imports and part of their crackdown. And confiscating gold and things like that. All these rumors are happening, and it's not going to happen in India. They have a very strong and and rich culture surrounding the possession of gold and trading it for weddings and various other. Um, uh, it's, it's basically their store of wealth. You know, right. there's there's still the smart people that are holding on to gold to save money instead of actually holding on to money to save money, and. <laughs> It's something that, that uh, families hand, hand down. It goes with children. At, at weddings, it gets exchanged. So gold is an integral part of their culture, uh, unlike most Western cultures where it's mostly just jewelry and occasionally it's an heirloom handed down, but wedding, wedding rings and, and things like that is about it. Now, this is not about terrorism or black markets or money laundering. It's strictly about the tax authority getting their piece of the pie. And the central bank getting another payday off the backs of hard-working Indians. As if the insidious inflation tax and fractional reserve banking were not enough. These are truly some of the worst people in the world. To, to do this to the entire group of people. And we'll, get to, we'll talk more about India in a later story and, and what else is going on with them. But first, uh, let's, uh, we've also got a, a related reading, and you can check out our blog for a link to this. But Pakistan is following suit. And they're going to be uh, looking to exchange out their 5,000 rupee note over the next three to five years. Right. Yeah. And just touching to the uh, statistic you said earlier about the 6% of the black market wealth being held in cash, this this 500 and 1,000 rupee confiscation, for lack of a better term, uh, is 86% of the country's printed currency. So it it really was going, you know, it was was a really out of left field play. And I, I can't believe this is the guy who got time... Time, well, you, Time did he actually win it? I don't remember if he got the official okay. nod. I think, no, Trump got the nod. Trump got yeah. the official nod, but the people's uh, popular vote was was PM Modi from uh, in India. Wow. Well, our next story is, uh, we're going to briefly talk about Italian. Uh, so we, we mentioned in Italy in uh, episode 178. We talked about how the world's oldest bank, Banca Monte di Pesce di Siena, was involved in creating false accounts to hide losses, and this was relating to the Deutsche Bank scandal that was going on. Well, they, they, they hide, hide losses from, from their derivative gambling that went south. Now, in episode 185, we covered how the Italian constitutional referendum did not take place the way that their PM had hoped. And this has major ramifications for the rest of the Eurozone and Italy possibly leaving the Euro, or at least getting the Lira back in circulation. Well, the, uh, Itali- Italy's parliament uh, can move fast after all. They've agreed to raise the public debt by 20 billion euros with speculation that some of that will be used to bail up Banco Monte. Now, this comes after the bank failed to raise 5 billion in capital from private investors. It should come as no surprise that given the bank's stock value has fallen more than 87% this year with a total value at less than half a billion euros. For the world's oldest bank, it's, it's teetering right on the edge. Wow. But um, here comes here comes the bailout. So uh, we we want to just quick take a moment and talk about a uh, an email. Uh, well, one of our listeners is is commented on the show, and, and we want to just mention that on the air. Yeah, Randy. sure. Actually, there's a couple things, two little things I wanted to bring up. We got a note from loyal Neocash Radio listener Elliot, just saying how much he enjoyed uh, Pedro being on the air with us last week. We talked with him about cryptocurrency mining. And of course, you can listen to episode 185 on neocashradio.com. Uh, we've also been busy here at the Neocash headquarters building our video podcast studio, like actually building it. 
<clears throat> yes, we've been putting up drywall. My I, hand hurts so bad from so much caulking. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, which we can still keep our, keep our clean rating, and I can say because I was caulking the ceiling and the walls, and all the soundproofing we're doing is is a tremendous amount of work, but it's going to be worth it, and we're getting very close to having this uh, additional podcasting space uh, ready soon. So we hope to be able to bring video to you. For now, we're just running the audio feed to uh, YouTube, but we hope to have some video to go along with that very yes. soon. Yes. So um, do we want to talk to Chris right now or go into the next story, Randy? Let's go into the next story, then talk to Chris, then go crypto. Okay, that's cool. All right, so our next story is about the IMF. Now, the, the, interna- I'm sorry, the International Monetary Fund is part of a triumvirate of international control and consolidation villains, as I describe them wow. personally, when combined with the World Trade Organization and the World Bank. Now, these secretive institutions have virtually no accountability and carry out a, a variety of different, what I would call, scandals. And at the core of what IMF does is offer or coordinate very attractive loans to governments and municipalities with a high risk of default. The whole point is to get them to default because then they have some leverage over them. So sometimes it's one loan, sometimes it's a series of loan, sometimes it's one really huge loan that you can't really get anywhere else, and then the interest rate just whatever. But the goal for the IMF is once the default has occurred, the real agenda comes out, and that is policy manipulation and austerity. So the IMF wants to dictate trade. They want to be able to decide who trades what where, and, and mostly free trade, of course. They, they want all the, uh, the, the tariffs and the taxes to be low, and I can agree with that part. But, but the other part of it is the austerity measures that they inflict. Now, there's a, we have a huge blog post that talks about this story. And there are some good links here that talk about what the IMF has done and in some backing up a lot of what I'm saying. And I encourage you to go read them. I don't have time to talk about them now. What I'm going to get into... What happened? ...is the latest news concerns the leader of the IMF, which is Miss Christine Lagrand, Lagrard, I'm sorry, Lagarde, and who was found guilty of, quote, negligence by a person in possession of public authority. The verdict surrounds a case of Bernard Tapie. I, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. A flamboyant French businessman and his stock in Adidas. In 1993, Mr. Tapie used a bank called Credit Lainus, uh, or Lainus, I can't pronounce <laughs> fresh words, to sell shares at a specific price. Credit Lainus was nationalized in 1945 and at this point was partly state owned. The bank was on the verge of bankruptcy and defrauded Mr. Tapie by s- selling his shares for more and keeping the profits, which is r- really bad. Now, Mr. Tapie sued Credit Leonis, and the court case went on for many years. During the length of the court case, uh, Credit Leonis was fully privatized in 1999. By 2003, it merged with another bank. Two name changes later, it's now called LCL, or Le Credit Leonis, which I guess doesn't really cover them up too much. Uh, well, here's where the story gets interesting. You see, Bernard Tapie had been elected as a socialist minister, and had been a member of the radical party of the left. In 2007, after 14 years of court battles, he swings his political sport over to then-Minister of the Interior, Nicolas Sarkozy, who went on to become the 23rd president of France. Not long after the election, Sarkozy's pick for finance minister, Christine Lagarde, intervenes in the 14-year-long court case and calls for a binding arbitration. How coinc- what a coincidence. Wow. wow. That's So that's quickly, crazy. too. In fact, on July 7th of 2008, not much longer after the election, the arbitration found in favor of Mr. Berner, of, of Mr. Berner and Tapie for 224 million euros plus interest and slapped on a 45 million euro penalty, which was unheard of at the time, for good measure, given the stress this put on the Tapie family. The, now, now, the French finance ministry was on the hook, and the public was outraged at the judgment. Then minister head, Christine Lagarde, who didn't challenge the judgment because she said it would have been costly, it would have caused costly new lawsuits for Bernard Tapie, who had helped her boss get elected. Now, she didn't add that last part. But ultimately, this latest decision set the fact straight. There will be no real effect on Miss Lagarde. The court decided not to impose a sentence or fine on her given her national and international stature, reaffirming the class system in play. Bernard is going to have to repay the money that he was awarded, given whatever. Otherwise, this just underscores the divide between the rulers and the rule. The IMF stands behind Miss Nagard and is confident that she can continue to carry out her duties as an economic hitman. Yeah, it was like $425 million. 
And uh, the, yeah. yeah, there's just there's, well, it was in euros, but right. I mean, but that, I, that actually, was the equivalent that I saw. Yeah, I, yeah. The, the original the number, the original number was a French franc franc number. This is way before the euro. Cause wow, this is how old it is. But wow. um, so this is just it's just amazing what's happening with the IMF and how they literally they get away scot free. So she you was she was convicted of being guilty. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. She's guilty, but there's no fine. There's no sentence. Oh, Incredible. You're, you're too powerful. We can't. It's a small amount. No, they didn't want to give her a criminal record. Yeah. Right? And yeah. But then after all that, the IMF is all on their websites, all like, we are 100% behind her. Yep. We believe in her. Well, wow, great. Wow. Because she'll, she'll do exactly what... Well, I, I've got... Well, we can go to Chris, or I actually did have... I have one more story of, of corruption that's pretty funny, actually. So I'm going to get it, and then yeah. we'll get Chris, and then oh, we'll go okay. crypto. All right. Okay. New York State Pension Fund. Uh, there's been a $2 billion pay-to-play scandal fueled by bribes, drugs, lavish trips, and prostitutes. Uh, so Navnur King, Kang, excuse me, was once responsible for managing over $53 billion in New York State employee retirement funds. And he's been accused of taking at least $180,000 in bribes after directing over $2 billion in pension business to two brokers. Now, the brokers earned millions of dollars in commissions for themselves and their firms, according to an indictment filed in federal court this week. The alleged bribes weren't just cash. The court papers mentioned cocaine, strippers, <laughs> nightclub bottle service, prostitutes, a $17,000 watch, weekend Montreal getaways, a Utah ski trip, plus tickets to a Paul McCartney concert in New Orleans, seven Broadway, sh- several Broadway shows, and the U.S. Open. Wow. It's funny how the, the cherry picked Paul McCartney right there. Yeah, yeah. That's, so the, the, Those were good bribes, though. Let me tell you, <laughs> if you want to bribe me, you come at me with a lot of this <laughs> stuff here, and, and you might just... I'm sorry, go on. Go on. Yeah, it's okay. Well, so the New York State Common Retirement Fund is the nation's third largest state pension fund, and it holds some $180 billion, $184 billion in assets. Kang served as the director of fixed income and head portfolio strategist there for just over two years before he was fired in February, according to the state controller's office. Now, I know you're not going to believe this. This is not the first time this has happened to this office. What? Uh, yeah, and it comes after so-called safeguards were put in place in 2010, when the former New York comptroller, Alan Havesi, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, pleaded guilty to felony charges of, quote, receiving reward for official misconduct. There was a four-year investigation that revealed uh, that he received nearly $1 million in bribes for state pension business, and that scandal actually led to criminal charges for eight people, with another 24 individuals and companies agreeing to civil settlements totaling $170 million. Um, so with... This, with uh, he was released from jail after serving just 20 months of a maximum four-year sentence. Now, he would also resigned from his post regarding totally different charges. He was found using four state employees to run personal errands and chauffeur his w- wife around, <laughs> and he paid $206,000 in restitution for the wages that were lost uh, by those employees to the state, as well as a $5,000 fine, but again, received no jail time or probation for those charges. So, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So the, I guess it doesn't matter if you're in the head of the IMF or you work for New York State. You know, either way, you're going to get away with whatever get some you want. kickbacks. And, and wow, cocaine and strippers, man. That's like <laughs> that's like a movie type like bribery right there. Yeah. One of the brokers, I guess, was uh, paid for airfare for for this guy and, and an undisclosed uh, com- like person to go with him up to Montreal for the weekend and stay at his place and do cocaine and get hookers. Wow. And- Did it say how the fund performed? <laughs> <laughs> no, but his LinkedIn profile, which which I kindly linked to on uh, neocashradio.com, uh, his 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 resume is quite. Uh, he talks he talks quite highly of himself. I can't pull it up in time, but uh, yeah, he's he's really proud of his. Uh, he's a seasoned portfolio manager and macroeconomic strategist who has built and managed fixed income portfolios across various investor objectives in both the private and public sectors. He has outperformed his peers year after year because of his astute investment strategies and sound judgment for value. <laughs> Sounds like he likes bartering. Yeah. <laughs> well, Chris, welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to talk about Open Bazaar now. And so you've just recently released a new update it's uh, up to 1.1.1 1. 1. 1. is that right that sounds about right okay so it's the uh, the 181 or 111 um so now the, people can make purchases with ether dash monero and more is that right yeah so we we um integrated uh worked with the uh, shapeshift uh people to just create like a little shapeshift button in the app and if you want to pay, you have some altcoins and you want to buy something on Open Bazaar, you can um, you know, just click that button and it pulls up a QR code um, to send the Bitcoin or the, the altcoins to. 
and that actually goes to Shapeshift, and then Shapeshift will deposit in the Bitcoin address of the seller or the multi-sig escrow or whatever, whichever one it is. Is there like, um, I mean, is there additional fee for that tacked on or? I, I mean, think, I, I think Shapeshift charges a fee, right? Um, yeah. I, so it's, it's pretty a, low, but So I it's know. a standard thing, like just whatever yeah. Shapeshift would normally charge. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay. So it, it's basically streamlining instead of going to having your own browser open with Shapeshift open and your browser open with open or whatever. Yeah. whatever. You, instead of having both of these open, it just... It removes a step. Yeah, it removes a step. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and I, I, you know, people probably could have done that before too without having any kind of, you know, actual integration in there, but it wasn't too too difficult to put in. I know a lot of people have been requesting pay with altcoins and um, I... Th- I wasn't expecting maybe as positive a response because, you know, when you do like shapeshift, it's not like the pure way of doing it. But I don't know. Some people seem pretty excited about it. Got a lot of play in like the Ether subreddits and and some of the other the other altcoin ones. So I mean, we'll see. Um, in the, the 2.0 version, I've been writing it to try and be like semi coin agnostic. So if someone wanted to like you know, write a little bit of code to make it work with another another coin like Zcash or something. I don't think it would be like terribly difficult to do. Um, <clears throat> but that that also kind of assumes that the coin isn't like a huge departure from Bitcoin because there's there's some like Bitcoin assumptions in, in there, I should say. But uh, I don't know. Maybe we'll see that next year, too. I don't know. We'll see if someone does that or not. So like you're uh, you're developing the back end and basically uh, the core aspect of this uh now the user doesn't necessarily see what you do cuz they're using the UI yeah but you're you're you keep you mentioned again talking to uh moving to, to 2.0 mm-hmm. and so what are the, what are some of the big the big features that you want to push out with 2.0 well i think um one of the big ones is um it's it's now using ipfs for the uh, which is um a protocol interplanetary file system um it it enables data to be cached more robustly around the network so that people can uh, use OpenBazaar and they don't per se need to keep the app running all the time in order to to buy and sell something. So I could make a, um, or I could open up the app, post some listings and close it out. And, and those listings can more or less still be visible on the network to other people, um, which is not how the the current version works. So that's that's a pretty big upgrade. The network is a lot more ro- reliable and robust and um, I think pretty cutting edge too, just the way everything is being done with that. So I'd say that's a big one. Um, you know, it's going to have a Bitcoin wallet built into it in that in this one, uh, which this week I was spending some more time writing that code. But um, all around, uh, I, I would expect like big performance improvements and um, it's going to function a little bit more like you would expect an e-commerce application to to function, um, even though it's like a desktop downloadable app. What are what are some of the, the challenges that you're you're sort of facing, or or not just not just you know obviously you want to you want to implement this this uh, feature or something like that, but like as you as you you learn from 1.0 and you're looking to 2.0 and maybe even beyond, you know what are some of the big like okay there's this this thing I want to and we need to tackle or some problem that's that that's been stymieing like that sort of stuff. Yeah, I think I think it was just the um, the big one is the the networking. Like I said, getting more data redundancy and caching the data around the network and all that, which required a pretty major network overhaul. Um, other than that, I don't know if there's any like super big challenges. It's just the biggest challenge I think is writing it so that it's it's extensible to things we might want to do in the future. So it doesn't require like massive changes uh, if we want to implement new features and and this sort of thing. Um, I, I spent some time, I don't know, a week or two ago looking through the um, the code base for the uh, R3, you know, the R3. Um, yeah. What, what the heck is that? Corda? Yeah, Corda, yeah. Yeah, yeah and it's actually really cool. And so I, I'm trying to, like, steal some ideas from that and possibly incorporate them. Um, but there's a lot of similarities, actually, between Corda and, and OpenBazaar, kind of. So, um, and, and not surprisingly, because uh, Ian Grigg, um, was kind of like an he, advisor for us a little bit on Open Bazaar, and he, you know he's also uh, advising um, R three there. So now you mentioned uh, the other people might be able to write a bit of code to use Zcash or something like that, or some other currency. 
do you do you have a lot of people adding in mods that that or adding like what what would it be called when someone does this? Is this something that you don't incorporate this in your your publication, right? It's sort of an add on option. Is that how- yeah? I mean, there might be. I don't know. There might be. We haven't written any kind of like plugin system for it yet, but it could potentially work as like a plugin. Um, but if not, it would just be a matter of just like recompiling it with a little bit of different code, and then you'd be essentially running a fork. But I've I think the it should be working such that like if someone did post some listings that like listed in Zcash, for example, like you would see that in the user interface that this is like a Zcash listing, but you'd have to, at least right now, you'd have to have a, you'd have to be using the Zcash Zcash fork, let's say, to make that purchase because we don't have any kind of like multi-wallet thing going on in there at this point in time. It's just like one wallet per per app, but, um, you know, maybe in the future it could handle multiple wallets, but. So do you, is the, the volume picking up the usage, uh, adoption sort of things like that? Is the holiday season seeing like an uptick in shopping? We've got a good deal. Um, uh, our Jen, our, our marketing person has done a really good deal of like finding deals and like posting about them on the Open Bazaar blog and like holiday stuff on Open Bazaar. It's kind of cool. Um, it's a little bit difficult to measure uh, usage just because I mean to some extent like like we're, we're not running like a centralized server or anything where like eBay can get like usage statistics they keep track of everything and so it's a lot more difficult for us to kind of collect stats and in fact right now we're actually not even doing we're doing like a really bad job of collecting data um, and so that's kind of like a big bigger task for us um, or I should say goal once we move over to this this new version the 2.0 version we're going to try and invest a lot more time in getting better stats or at least to the extent that we we can get them because it's like it's you know largely you know anonymous or encrypted traffic and this sort of stuff so there might be some like opt-in you know people can like opt-in and send some data you know to us to collect it and if not i mean we can measure like we can crawl the network and see how many people are on how many listings are available this sort of stuff how many ratings have been left so there are things that we can collect um but just not uh, as detailed as, say, other platforms. Now, one final question. I guess, um, obviously, if Randy has anything, you know, we have some other stories, too, to talk about. Um, but one of the, one of my uh, sort of early extent, I, I used PayPal, I mean, not PayPal, eBay, way back in the day, of course, and, and years ago. Um, but the dispute resolution, like if people had an issue with uh, the sender not sending something or the, the whatever, is there, do you have something like that built in at the moment? Yeah, so that uses um, the the multi signature in Bitcoin with the two of three multi signature as an escrow. Um, so the way it works it right now is um, you can send bitcoins directly to the vendor if you want. If you're buying something, that direct payment is an option. Um, but the vendor can also pick. Um, one or more, we call them moderators. They're basically like an escrow arbitrator agent kind of. Moderator is just kind of a easier term for people to understand. Maybe I don't know. Um, but it when you when a vendor the vendor can basically pick a list, and as a as a buyer that that list is kind of like offered to you as like part of the bundle that's being offered up for sale. So as a buyer, if you don't like any of those moderators, you don't recognize any, or you don't trust any of them then you probably might not want to buy something from that person, right? So there is a little bit of an incentive for the seller to kind of go with someone who's reputable, um, who, you know, people might have note about or post about or, or what have you. And so if, if they do include a reputable moderator, you select them, and then the funds go into a multi-signature address in which it requires essentially the consent of two out of the three parties to release the funds, um, so that those two could, the, the, um, expectation is after the buyer receives the product, then him and the vendor will jointly agree to release the funds and you don't even have to involve the moderator. Um, but if there is a dispute and you do have a dispute resolution, um, process to go through, um, then the moderator can choose who, who's going to side with and release the funds or even have like a split payout is also possible. Wow. So, um, it's, is there like a social system built in that, that people can uh, talk about their experience or, or is there, have you thought of maybe adding that? Uh, we, <clears throat> we have thought about it a little bit. I mean, there is chat built into the app right now, um, which will probably improve a little bit in the new version. We, we may potentially maybe add like chat rooms in there at some point. 
possibly. Um, but at the same time, people can just use like our subreddit or something like this to to talk about it. It's it's not that big. I think the key there with the escrow is like um, you, you obviously have to pick, you know, um, you know, someone who's trustworthy, but it is like an kind of like an open market for that service. So that's where it's different than say eBay, where that's, you know, how eBay is going to, you know, take a cut of every transaction like that, for example, whereas in, in open bazaar, it's like, you know, anyone can perform that function and potentially make a little bit of money if you're good at it, you know? So it, it kind of, um, opens that up in a way that isn't like monopolized by a single company. Okay. One last question. I promise. Okay. Um, how does Open Bazaar make money? I mean, is there do you get a cut of what each trend, each each sale, or or how does this work? No, um, we don't have like a really well defined business model at the moment. Um, I, I I the idea I think is to sell some kind of like services to people around the network. Um, you know, it's like once you build a big network with like a lot of users, it shouldn't be like too difficult to find something to sell them to make money off of. I tend to think it'll probably come from maybe having like ads, um, you know, advertisements, whether it be on like a web gateway or... Or like promote your product, pay yeah. a little bit to Open Bazaar, and we'll make sure it gets, you know... Yeah, so... Featured listings. Featured, yeah. Yeah, so in the app... So one of the challenges is um, how, do, how do we like discover like interesting products and stuff like this, right? Because right now um, in the 1.0, and it's, I, I think maybe, in, for, certainly from a buyer's perspective, maybe one of the biggest... Um, uh, problems with it right now is it's just kind of like pulling random listings from whoever you happen to be connected to. And it's a little bit like sorting through like a junk bin, right? Like it's, it's like 99% you're probably not interested in. And so there needs to be like some much better way of like finding the interesting content and bringing that forward for the user. But it's like, how do you do that in a decentralized fashion, right? That's like, that's like a big challenge. And so I think what we came up with is um, something similar in concept, although it's probably not going to look like it, but similar in concept to maybe like a Pinterest board where each user can kind of curate content and create like lists of products and like a basically a page or a board or something like this. Um, and then they can share that board around and that would be distributed around the network um, and, and it would be seeded by different nodes. Um, and so there would be, you know, data redundancy just like, like you might have in say BitTorrent or something like that. And um, I think the working title for that now is channels, but the idea is that like users can kind of create channels to curate content and it could be like different categories, right? So it could be like, um, you know, one, someone creates maybe like a more general channel for products somewhere where they try to categorize like everything. Maybe someone just creates a channel for shoes or cannabis or something, you know? Sure. Um, so, now, someone obviously has to be like the default channel there to go to. So, I mean, that's I, th I think it's probably going to be us. And so maybe we can slip some ads in there on the default channel or something like that. Um, you know, people pay us to put some products up on there. So we'll see. Awesome. Well, I'll go with a very simple question. If I want to buy or sell something on Open Bazaar, where do I go and how do I do that? Uh, yeah, you can go to openbazaar.org. There is a download button, and you can just download it and check it out. Try to make it as self-explanatory as possible. It shouldn't be too difficult to use. And like I said, it's it's we've got big improvements planned coming down the pipe. Um, maybe next year at some point we might have a web version possibly. I think that's kind of like the the next big thing we're going to try and tackle. Um, so if you're like just looking to like browse stuff and buy, we you might be able to do that like directly from a browser which I think we can do, the technology's like been improving fast enough where I think we can actually get like a peer-to-peer a -peer node running in a browser, which would be, um, uh, I'd say like right on the bleeding edge, if you will. So, you know, people uh, would not necessarily have to be going through kind of like centralized gateways to the network that they could just make direct peer-to-peer -peer connections. A peer-to-peer -peer node running in your browser. You heard it here first, the folks, <laughs> on Neocache Radio, neocacheradio.com. Well, it, so besides besides the software, I mean, what yeah. else would I need to, to to buy or sell something? I mean, is there a lot? Is there any kind of user registration, user information I have to put in? or And then for selling, is there any kind of barrier yeah. to entry or no no there's no barrier to entry it's just you just basically just have to know how to use bitcoin really i think the biggest barrier to entry for most people is to just you know if you want to buy something you first have to acquire bitcoin um you know and if you're a seller you have to you know have some way of cashing out if that's what you want to do is cash out so um you know we're we're we we're 
looking towards ways to kind of like make that a little bit easier for people to do is is handle Bitcoin. Although thankfully right now, I mean, most of the people using OpenBazaar are like cryptocurrency fans, so it's not like a huge issue for them. Um, but yeah, if we want to get more mainstream adoption, that is a, a, a pretty big barrier to entry. But there's no like registration or anything like that. You just basically just open the app and go. Cool. So Very you got cool. the software, you got the Bitcoin, you can buy or sell anything. Yep. Anyone can. Excellent. Very cool. Well, next up, we have a story here. Uh, Randy has a story here, and I'm sure uh, some of you have ho- heard about this this thing going on. Randy, what's happening? Social engineering. So hackers are using social engineering to take control of people's phone numbers, uh, emails, and cryptocurrency wallets. Forbes writer Laura Shin takes a look at how malicious actors are able to get a phone company to port your number into their control. So they'll actually call your phone company and pretend to be you right? and give them, you know, usually easily findable information or, you know, they can concoct enough of a story to just kind of work a a, a person at a uh, phone bank that might not really care that much about their job, right. uh, you know, being able to get them to then shift your phone number to a new device or something like that over to a new carrier entirely. Yep. So, some, so someone else will take control of your phone account that way and then click reset password on like Gmail or whatever your email account is and the password reset will be sent to the phone. Wow. And so then they're able to gain access to uh, the emails and then gain access to any number of other passwords, including those accessing uh, oftentimes cryptocurrency wallets and things like that. So uh, the article that we linked to on neocashradio.com uh, takes a look at early Bitcoin adopter Jared Kenna and how he lost millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin in exactly this kind of social engineering scam. Quote, within seven minutes of being locked out of his first account, Kenna was shut out of up to 30 others, including two banks, PayPal, two Bitcoin services, and crucially, his Windows account, which was the key to his PC. So he was like awake at night, you know, working on some stuff, as many computer geeks are, and, you know, saw these emails that his uh, password had been reset. And by the time he tried to click them and fix it, it had already, like, he was already out. Uh, and the author says, Kenna is one of a spate of recent hackings of high-profile cryptocurrency industry players, such as venture capitalists, entrepreneurs, C-level executives, and others who have had their phone numbers hijacked. And uh, the article actually gives quite a big list of people who had. And uh, we've, we've got a link to uh, the Kraken blog, where we actually talked about this uh, last week. Uh, an early supporter of Augur and Ethereum, Bo Shen, had his accounts drained in a similar way. Uh, Changely was able to return about a third of the stolen funds to him, which I have also included an update link to. Um, but definitely recommend if you want to check that out. I called, I actually got on the chat with uh, my phone company today and asked them to flag my account um, and to put a, a lock on you know, porting, like to freeze porting and to put a lock on the SIM so that those kinds of things can't be switched. And I put a pin on uh, all, all my sort of stuff so that uh, I need to be well, know, extra, extra contacted. So the, the Kraken blog has some really nice link uh, ideas on how to better secure your phone number and your account so that this kind of thing doesn't happen. And You know, these phone companies just, just I mean, the, uh, what good news? Okay, the good news that comes out of phone companies is the technology behind smartphones is amazing. It's just amazing. The, all, all of human knowledge in the palm of your hand, it's amazing. But the phone companies seem to be run by morons. Yeah. How, how how would you just let someone call up and pretend to be someone else and shift their number? What are you thinking? You know, I think the phone companies ought to be held responsible for every dime that was stolen. Right. Ultimately, it's their fault. Yeah. You were an idiot. You hired an idiot. Yeah. Well, it's not it's not just phone companies. Uh, well, this this was also phone company related. Um, Ethereum's forums were actually uh, compromised. There was a database, a backup of a database from April 2016. Um, and Ethereum developer Hudson Jameson went to the blog to report that some 16,500 forum users were affected uh, with the hackers gaining access to usernames, email addresses, IP addresses, public and private messages, profile info, and hashed passwords. Uh, the, all the forum users' passwords have been reset, and users who may have had their information compromised are being contacted via email. Uh, the Ethereum team is also implementing additional security measures, including, get this, encrypting sensitive data. I, I really, with Ethereum, I can't believe that wasn't already being done, but uh, they're removing their recovery phone numbers from their email accounts. The attacker actually claims to be the same person that hacked Bo Shen, uh, as we talked about last week, and they used social engineering to gain control of a mobile phone number to get access to the account, including one that had access to that Ethereum forum database back. You know, I, I don't know if I completely, I don't know if I completely believe this. You know, my skeptical, scientific part of my brain, uh, it, it says to me that th- this has happened a lot. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, how many phone call company representatives are just randomly, willy-nilly switching phone numbers to brand new phones and devices? Well, no. If if I called my phone company and said, hey, I found a better plan at this other company, I want to port my number, that happens all the time. And so I'm just calling to say, like, hey, I'm, yeah, I've got a, I found a better plan. And there's See no you later. verification? You just have to answer a couple very simple questions. Last for your social or, you know, those, those kinds of things. I think it's far simpler yeah. than than we think it is. Um, you know, I, 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 it, I, it sounds easy now that, now that I hear it, but yeah, like it's just not, it would have I, never enter my mind that it's that easy to take control over someone's account. So here, so I, I was just shopping today. It's the shopping season, of course. And I went to one of the stores I went to, I won't name, but at, I went, I actually bought two things in two different registers in the store and both times they asked me for my phone number. And all the other customers standing around, I, I heard a half a dozen phone numbers just standing there. Yeah. And then I heard their address. And then I heard their name, right? Yep. Because they, they guy just read it off the screen. Is this you? Is this your at? You're still at uh, 15 Pine Lane? Yeah. yeah. Like, like, what, what? No. The whole reason I tell cashiers, no, I, I'm, I'm paying cash. Cash today. You can call me Mr. Cash. <laughs> My phone number is cash. <laughs> and then I just hold cash. You know, you got to protect yourself. Giving your phone number out for everything is ridiculous. And I don't like this two-factor two authentication that either requires you to put in your phone number once again, mm-hmm. or you you have some uh, smartphone, some some SMS device thing with your smartphone, which could obviously be hijacked or stolen or taken from you. I don't like any of that. I don't. Yeah. I don't like any of those two factor authentications because they all always introduce a second vulnerable, a second angle of attack. Well, if that's just the second layer, though, it's better than not doing it, right? Well, what's the point of intru- introducing a second layer of vulnerability if the first layer wasn't good enough? Well, if the second layer is, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if your password wasn't good enough, then you failed, <laughs> sir. You failed. There's a simple test. I mean, I, am I being too harsh or, or is this like... Well, people have a really difficult time making like strong passwords. I mean, it's almost to the point where any human readable pa- uh, password or human memorable password, it can be broken by a computer with these algorithms. I mean, it's almost to the point where if your password's memorable in any way, shape, or form, it can be broken. And this is where cryptocurrencies really shine. And the fact that you're using a public key and not displaying the private key is, I think, the future of passwords. Yeah. So how can we how can we make a password system that does that for everyday web browsing? Yeah. They need they need like I think they need like hardware devices to be able to do that, you know, to have like keys embedded in them and and I think we're getting there slowly. Yeah. Well, and that <clears throat> excuse me, that Forbes article I was talking about earlier uh, that we linked to talks a lot about how <clears throat> two-factor authentication, especially via text messages, is no longer being favored as a security measure. Um, and it talks a little bit about how the the main problem is that they not everyone has a smartphone, and there's plenty of people who still have you know, dumb phones, for lack of a better term. But that I have a dumb phone, <clears throat> right? But that's but that's the only. You know, my my security is incredible. Mm-hmm. In one on one hand, I'm incredibly difficult to track, and and if someone takes my phone, they get nothing. Yeah, it it doesn't even have my name attached to it. Now, here's the other thing: we just talked earlier in this show about how governments uh, are, are, are susceptible to bribes. They do all kinds of bad things. They spend money poorly. They they do bad things. And we talked in previous episodes about how AT and T was selling everything you do on your phone to law enforcement whenever they asked. We talked about Yahoo selling all of the email information of your account to whomever they want, you know, basically. They just had another huge breach, too. Another huge breach from Yahoo recently. Like, your data is not secure. Your phone is not secure. Mm-hmm. Your, nothing you have is secure, okay? The only thing you have that's secure is the Bitcoin wallet on your hardware that you own, okay? Not on blockchain.info. Yeah. Or, or whatever other web browser is holding your Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, if you're assuming, and that's assuming you you made it correctly, right? Like offline. Yeah. On a- I mean, you there is no security because here's the thing: if if they have if if you are using two factor authentication, okay, right? You you something is sent to your phone. Well, your phone's being monitored right now. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, anything that happens on your phone is is. And we even had that story. What was it? Like three weeks ago, we had a story about the Chinese. Having uh, the 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 hardware, the firmware in the phones, mm-hmm. sending updates either daily or every three days 
to the server in Shanghai, to a private company of everything that your chat logs did, your phone logs, your data of where you went, what you did with your apps, what what everything. Mm-hmm. Every every week, every day it was sent for your uh, your uh, your call logs and every three days for your, your uh, text logs. So it's like they, they know all your, your two-factor. They know all your stuff. Yeah. You send a password through Facebook, it's go- that password is no good anymore. Yeah. You know, I mean, this is the reality I, we I live did, in. I did laugh while I was, like, telling the person the pin I wanted to use, like, yeah. on, at my phone company. I was like, wow, this doesn't feel that secure, actually. <laughs> right. And then you're trusting. I mean, it's just like you're, there's so many layers of trust that have to happen. And, and the, the only thing we have going for us as individuals is the fact that there are so many individuals. Yeah. There are so many better targets, potentially. So I'm not saying that you 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 should you should uh, be afraid of of using anything. No, you should have a very skeptical and realistic viewpoint of the security you actually have, and you should always be working to improve it. Mm-hmm. So um, we got uh, Ethereum. Geez, more news from Ethereum. What what's with this new release from from Ethereum's Geth client? Uh, yeah, Geth 1.5. It's integrated an alpha version of Swarm in its main client, so it's still on the uh, the test net, the Robston Ethereum test chain. Um, but basically, Swarm is a distributed storage platform and content distribution service. It's a native base layer service of the Ethereum Web3 stack. Uh, so it is similar to a Dropbox or FTP server where you can upload and download and share files, um, but it is completely peer-to-peer. Uh, there's going to be a built-in incentive system, which will make Swarm self-sustaining. It allows participants to sell resources like bandwidth or storage against Ether. Uh, but yes, it is very alpha, according to this uh, this pl- this post from btcmanager.com. Uh, the first integration in Geth enables tech-savvy users to use Swarm in the Robston Ethereum test chain, while the incentive system is not enabled. To demonstrate that Swarm works, the Ethereum Foundation is running the Swarm homepage with a 35-strong cluster on the Azure Am I saying that right? Yeah. Azure yeah. Cloud with the uh, decentralized network. If you want to access the homepage, you can use Swarm by yourself. And there is a guide that the blog links to on how you can become part of the Swarm if you want to test it out. Well, so isn't, I mean, am I wrong by saying that they're late to the game because LBRY already has all this functionality? I mean, am I miscorrect in stating that? I mean, that's what LBRY is, a content distribution platform based on a blockchain, right? Yeah, yeah. I I think there are a lot of people who are trying to do stuff similar. Wasn't yeah. there? There's like, I know there's storage and Filecoin and is it made safe? I don't think anybody do... is as ahead of the game as yeah. far as our LBRY is probably the the cutting edge of of this of what Swarm is doing. Yeah. I mean, I can't, I don't know of anyone else that has as as big of uh, an ambitious network and whatnot, and and the fact that it's it's on multiple uh, OSs already. So well, it'll be interesting to see what Swarm no, does for I, sure. I love I love all the stuff happening with Ethereum because uh, as as we talked before the show, I think one of the big factors I'm looking at from a grand standpoint is the overall data that human uh, the, the human knowledge base growth and and testing all these different methods of solving all these different problems is great. And I think the more iteration that happens, the more that we we could potentially learn. So, what's your what's your thoughts on Ethereum, Chris? Um, I, I, I think it's still kind of, it seems a bit early to, to make any like real judgments on it. There's still a lot of big changes being made and planned. And so, um, I think once I start seeing like some really, um, big time apps built on top of it that have like a lot of users and this sort of stuff, that's when, um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll have a, like a better idea how it's working. That's a healthy skepticism right there. I, I I I'm less skeptical and more of a more of a believer, but uh, I do I do have that skepticism, and I'm I'm not like putting all my tokens into the Ethereum basket, so to speak. So, um, wow, we have we have a bunch more st- a couple more stories here to talk about, and um, it's just two, and I, I this one I can let, definitely we make can get sure them quick. Then yeah. we'll do them. Cool. So the, there's uh, reports that botnet mining is back. So this is something that happened with Bitcoin a couple of years ago, where there was malware sort of going out with uh, other often with other pirated uh, software bundles and things like that but it would just be a little bit of uh, hidden malware that would use an infected computer to mine cryptocurrencies and channel the rewards to the attacker's wallet 
Uh, now it's being used with Zcash. Just a few days after the launch of the new cryptocurrency Zcash, which we, of course, covered on Neocash Radio, episode 180, uh, Kaspersky Labs began noticing several incidences where Zcash mining software was installed on users' computers without their permission. They, they would see it. It was actually the Zcash miner, but it was a different name, like system.exe or uh, taskmanager.exe or something like that. So they've actually been able to identify about 1,000 unique users who are using some version of this Zcash miner, uh, but with a different file name. So um, there's, wow. yeah, they're saying the average computer does about 20 hashes per second, but if you can extrapolate that out to the 1,000 infected computers, you're now doing 20,000 hashes a second, and at uh, today's prices, that would be about $30,000 a year for the attacker. Um, and while the infected users might not know that the program is installed in their computer or even their smartphone, uh, because Zcash is meant to be ASIC resistant, actually, like G- CPU and GPU mining can be used for it. So even a smartphone could theoretically mine Zcash while you sleep. Um, but it would definitely, you definitely see a rise in your electric bill and you would see a sizable slowdown on your computer speed because the mining software could eat about eight, up to 90% of the device's RAM. So. I'm sure the device would be very warm, too. I mean, it's using all the <laughs> processors. The battery's going full steam. I just imagine these poor people use it. It's probably like some Windows 7 machine, you know? That's like, that's like they, they just have no idea what's going on. Hey, this is a Windows 7 machine recording the show right now. And you know what? This is the most reli- one of the most reliable computers in <laughs> I've well, ever had. and Zcash CEO and founder Zuko Wilcox told Motherboard, unfortunately, we have no way to prevent this kind of thing since Zcash is an open source network like Bitcoin that nobody, including us, controls. Our recommendation to security companies that detect this kind of activity, like Kaspersky, is that their software should alert users when potentially malicious software, like that described in their blog post, is detected and give the user the option of shutting it down or if it was deliberately installed by the user, allowing it to run. And just another little note, there's an upcoming event tomorrow, uh, Thursday, December 22nd, from noon to 2 p.m. Pacific time. Zcash Core Developers will be hosting a technical AMA in their forum. So if you have any technical questions for them, you can find them there. What time is that? Uh, Thursday, tomorrow, from noon to 2 Pacific. Okay. Well, Bitcoin mining may be coming more mainstream. I mean, it's it's interesting. So I, I, I saw as in my Bitcoin feed, my news feed, as I was researching for the show, a Huffington Post article that talks about Bitcoin mining. And I just had to click through. Now, Huffington Post, in my previous experience, has pretty much been a very political place with a lot of politically charged and, and often emotionally charged articles. And I won't even go into why. I, I don't even care. Really, I don't go there. But... I saw this article. I had to click through. I watched, I looked at it, and it is a pretty good a pretty good uh, initiation to how what Bitcoin mining is and how does it work and whatnot. Without, of course, giving too many details and really distract them. But was so, it as good as the video we made, JJ? No, I don't decrypting think decrypting so. Bitcoin, the blockchain technology Not, explained. No, it didn't. Didn't <laughs> even scratch the surface of that video. I All mean, right. But anyway, it, it, I just like to see this sort of stuff. Like the Huffington Post is definitely a, a place where you'll get some uh, lots of eyeballs, some viewpoints that won't necessarily uh, jive with the conservative angle, the financial angle, things like that. So I think Bitcoin is is cross cultural, it's cross uh, it, it, it boundaries of, of borders and languages and things like that. I think it's a universal thing, mm-hmm. and I'm always happy to see it move into those uh, other areas that that might not be so quick to pick up on Bitcoin. So uh, kudos to you having to post for that one there. And uh, Chris, I mean, any final thoughts? Once again, where could people go to find out about Open Bazaar? Yeah, you can just go to openbazaar.org, and uh, there's also a subreddit and a Slack channel if you have any questions, and we're available most of the time to answer. Excellent. And um, my, my prediction... To round out, the, I, I had more questions. I kept wanting to ask you. Every time you answered a question, I had more. But my prediction for, for, for your platform is that uh, the future of it will integrate social media and plugins. Yeah. And the sooner you can get those two things going, the sooner it's going to be a hot thing. I think the reputation system you're building with sales will be the foundation for a reputation system that will include people's social and like they, they're... they're you know, the personality and things like yeah, that. That'd be cool. But because it's built off of actions that we can measure and we can we can say, oh, well, this is a good experience or a bad experience or, you know, whatever. It's, but they're real actions yeah. that everyone can relate to. Well, did you get your package? Was yeah. it what you what they said it was? Well, cool, because it's very simple. Yeah. If you can do that, then you get five stars, right? Like, um, 
I, I really think integrating the social aspect and the plugins so that people can modify their experience themselves. And then that takes a workload off of your shoulders. Yeah. But anyway, those two things I think are the future. And you'll be like, wow, I just made, I, I can't you heard believe, it first from JJ. I can't <laughs> believe I made Facebook 2.0 here in open bazaar. <laughs> What's okay. My final question as we're, as we're nearing the hour mark of the show. Wow. What's the most bizarre thing about Open Bazaar? The bu- bizarre thing, like sold on it? I, it? I'm just, I'm leaving it open. However, you oh, interpret that. I, I, there hasn't been like any like seriously bizarre stuff, but the one thing that does stick out was like there was this one post someone made in like a, a subreddit where he sounded like, you know, he needed some like therapy and counseling, like he was like borderline suicidal. But he's like, I he's like, I've got nothing to offer. He, he's like, I'm willing to sell my my body to whoever wants it, and we'll just swap the brains out, right? Like if you if you need a new body, okay. he's and he's like, I made this post on eBay, and they took it down. Yeah. So he's like, so I'm posting on Open no. Bazaar. <laughs> well, are you are you able to take down his post? No, of no. course not. No, <laughs> that's the beautiful part. Yeah. So well, he was. I don't know. He's trying. Trying to sell uh, sell his uh, his body to someone who would put it to good use, he said. Just a reminder, you can tune into Neocache Radio every Wednesday night. If you don't want to miss a single moment of awesome Neocache content, including special episodes and bonus interviews, subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, Library, and more. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Chris. And uh, go to openbazaar.com to check out .org. More. .org, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, you just screwed up another outro. <laughs> <laughs> this is JJ and Randy for Neocash Radio. Where we discuss the future of money today.